Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about groups. This is an incredibly important chapter. When I first started teaching sociology, I did not at all recognize how important it was until I had an epiphany moment and all things started to come together. But essentially, groups are really important. The groups that you identify with are associated with the culture you identify with, the common way of life. It's also associated with how you are socialized into that common way of life. From an intersectional perspective, the groups that you identify with, where you're located within those groups is associated with whether or not you can rise up the social class ladder. For example, people that didn't historically have an education, a good job, or wealth, people that were historically female or non-white or a sexual minority that such as identifying with homosexual, they were not allowed to rise up the social class ladder and they were socially controlled and blocked from getting access to a good job to be able to improve their lives. Okay, so the groups that you're associated with not only are associated with your culture, but they're also associated with whether or not you can rise up the social class hierarchy. So to begin with, do we need people? Absolutely. We need people. Without people, we do not develop. So it is built into our biology to socially interact with other people, if only to fulfill our basic needs like sex and attachment, food, shelter, working together as a group. These are all built in. If you are not connected to a group, the sociological term for that is anime, that disconnect from others, okay? Being separate from a group, a state of normlessness. So we need to be connected to our group. And as Durkheim found in chapter one, as you guys learned, Suicide rates are associated with whether or not we're connected to a group. Therefore, people that are connected to a group tend to have less suicide rates than those that aren't connected to a group. Okay, so the types of groups, a group defined is just a collection of people, two or more people. Okay, your primary groups, those are the ones that you're exposed to first and foremost, like your family, your main peers, that's your primary group, okay? Secondary group are your acquaintances, people you work with, you know, people you encounter throughout your life. Your in-group is the group that you identify with. Your out-group is the group that you don't identify with and often have hostility towards, which is really sad that that's built into the definition that other people would have hostility toward other groups. But again, this is where the multicultural you know, embracing is very important to overcome a lot of our prejudice and discrimination toward other groups, okay? So group identification is associated with horizontal versus vertical structure, whether or not we're able to rise up the social class ladder or whether or not we expose ourselves to other groups, okay? So when you identify with a group, you tend to internalize their culture. But also when you identify with a group, it's associated with whether or not you can rise up the social class ladder. So your status is where you're located within a group. So think about the hierarchy of sex. Who has the most power and who historically had the least power? You know, historically males have dominated society and women have been subjugated for thousands of years. Therefore, if you take the group sex, it is subdivided into two groups, males and females, where your I what group you belong to, either males or females, was associated with your social location, where you were located with compared to other people. Your status is determined with how many positions of power do you have? Do you have an education or not? Do you have a good job or not? Are you male or not? Historically, being non-white meant minority status, meant not being able to work up the social class ladder. Therefore, were you white or not? And this is the really sad parts of society that we're talking about here, but this is how privilege worked. Therefore, males that were white were able to rise up the social class ladder or at least had access, privilege to be able to do it. Whereas all women and minorities were historically denied access based upon their status within groups. Okay. The United States was historically a very racist and sexist place. Now you can see incredible improvements that have happened, especially since the civil rights movement, but it's still not equitable between men and women. Women still get paid less than men. Women still experience prejudice and discrimination. White privilege still exists. You see it in the hiring practices. Who do they call? Emily or Latasha? Okay, eight times to one, they're going to give Emily the call back for the interview and deny access to Latasha. Okay, 
So again, your ascribe status, that's the status that you were born with. And your achieve status, that's the status that you earned. But not everybody has the ability to get the achieve status and work their way up the social class ladder because of prejudice and discrimination. Okay, so your socioeconomic status is a combination of all these variables. Where are you located within these positions? And that determines where you're located to compare to other people in society. Okay, the groups we belong to are also associated with social roles. For example, we expect men to behave differently than we expect women. Those are called gender roles. Okay, so society socializes you that whatever group you identify with, you're supposed to act like that group. Therefore, we socially control and socialize boys to act like boys and girls to act like girls. And whether or not that's fair, that's the really big question, because how does the socialization of gender roles influence our behavior? Okay, the idea that a man should be a breadwinner, is this because of socialized gender roles and a woman should be a homemaker? Well, how many women, because of the socialization of gender roles, think that it is their job to stay home with the kids? But that's the number one way that we keep women down. Traditional ideology that says a woman should be in a home, that's what society does when males want to dominate society. They want women to think that because then that job is taken care of and men are free to go do whatever they want. So again, how much of gender roles are functional, serve a purpose? How much of gender roles create conflict in society because of the inequality that results from gender roles? And then realize gender roles, we make them up. We're the ones who decide how men and women should be. That's just pure symbolic interactionism. Okay, so Goffman talks about dramaturgy, the idea that we're all actors on a stage. We all learn the role we're supposed to play. We then read the script, and then we start to act out that script by modeling that behavior. We also engage in impression management to create positive impressions upon other people about ourselves so that people like us and think we're doing a good job of fulfilling our roles. So, but again, the role you play in society is determined by your status, okay? Your status within groups is associated with the role you're going to play. Why have we never had a female president? Okay, because again, we've socialized it that men are supposed to be in politics and women are supposed to be home. And we're just now starting to challenge that idea. And we need to challenge that idea, otherwise we're going to have inequality between men and women forever. Social networks are incredibly important. So how our groups all interact and your networks between groups is associated with, um, you know, your social life, but also with your access and ability to rise up the social class network. Okay, so a social network are these direct and indirect ties to other people. Your reference group, that's the group that you look to to decide what role should I play? How should I play it? How should I behave? <coughs> Cooley's looking glass self. This is where we start to get into some powerful social psychology. Because, again, how we feel about ourselves is based upon how we think other people in society feel about us. Therefore, when we go to figure out who am I as a person, I look out to society and I say, okay, how does society feel about me? So now put yourself in the position of a woman. And think of yourself as a woman and look out at society and say, okay, how does society feel about women? What stereotypes do you guys see reflected back? Not all of them are pretty. When a black male looks out and says, how does society feel about me? What's reflected back? When an, a Mexican person looks out and says, how do they feel about me? What do you see back? And again, this is where you start to see the effects of stereotypes. Okay, these negative attitudes toward groups of people. Because of prejudice and discrimination, all of us have been socialized to be biased towards specific races, ethnicities, religions, other groups. Okay? And this is, again, why you're, you're, where you're located within groups is associated with rising up the social class ladder. Because an African-American male, yes, he can check the box for male, but because he can't check the box for white, how is that associated with an African-American male experiencing prejudice and discrimination based upon socially constructed stereotypes that have no truth? Who's more likely to be a criminal, a white person or a black person or a Latino? White person, guys, two times the one. Who's more likely to have drugs and, and guns in their car when a cop pulls them over? A white person. 
Who are the cops more likely to pull over? A Latino, eight times to every time they pull over a white person. Okay, that's what prejudice and discrimination looks like. It's not pretty. It's not fair. And again, this is why we either need to A, stop calling ourselves white and black and tear down racism, or B, change the meaning at least attached to race. So that when we socialize people about difference, we don't socialize negative stereotypes. Because we all know the negative stereotypes. What's the number one reason people say they wouldn't vote for a woman president? All the surveys that I've done are always like, a woman's too emotional. That's the stereotype. But from a psychological perspective, guys, emotions, coping and managing with your emotions, talking about them, dealing with them, confronting them, that makes you smarter. So who's smarter, a man or a woman? Someone who's more emotional or someone who denies their emotions? Well, when it comes to brain growth and brain activity, the emotional person, as long, of, of course, as they're stable. But again, why are girls doing better in college in modern times than men? Women are crushing it. Men are falling behind when it comes to that. Women are getting more degrees than men. Is it because they are culturally allowed because of gender roles? It's okay for a woman to experience emotions, whereas men are encouraged to be stoic and deny their emotions. But denying your emotions is denying your ability to grow mentally, for your intelligence to grow. So group size. You have dyads, a group of two, that's the smallest, and then triads, three, and then all the way up, okay? As group size increases, interaction and bonding decrease. However, stability increases, okay? So yes, in modern times, you might not have the same interaction if you live in the city than you do like living in a small town, for example, but the stability of the city, because there's so many people all working together. It's bureaucratized and formal. It tends to work better. Okay, now a really fun question I like to ask is, do we depend on more people now than we ever did before? And this is what we coined the globalization effect, is that when you turn on a light switch, how many people does it take to make that light switch work? You know, how many people does it take for the electric company to run the whole bureaucracy of it all? If a nuke goes off, how many people does it affect? So again, even though we might be less interactive and less bonding with you know as many people as we might have back in the day, we actually depend on more people now than we ever did historically. Okay, so what holds groups together? What holds society together even though we have all this conflict and turmoil? Okay, one, the institutions of society. Okay, they all structure our lives. They all serve a purpose to hold stuff together, like the education system, the government, the economy. Um, the family all work together to, you know, create a stable society. But you also have this, what creates group cohesion? What creates that bond? Psychologically, um, when you interact with another person, neurotransmitters are released. So you get brain rewards through social interaction. So that's one thing, you know, like the oxytocin being released in your brain. So again, we get rewards for interacting with other people. It's biologically built into us to interact with other people. But then what holds us together? This group cohesion, this sense of solidarity or loyalty to a group, you know. So think about all the things that strengthen bonds of I'm an American. I'm proud to be an American. You know, every 4th of July we get together. We have baseball and football and all of our sports. We have all the things that we do that just kind of hold us together. You can think about it like that. Groupthink is the concept that when bureaucracy becomes too large, people are scared to speak up. And so you, everyone tends to be agreeable and conform to the norms of the group. But that poses problems because, again, we need diversity. We need diverse opinions to be able to deal with all the things that come at us. So, again, even in the most formal system, we still need people questioning the president. Not, I mean, that's pretty relevant for what just happened, of course. But, again, we need to be questioning those in power. We need to be, you know, making sure that, like, you know, the tyranny of all doesn't bring down everybody. So diversity is very important. Okay? All of us are influenced by other people. You guys truly do care what people think about you, even if you don't, you want to say you don't care what people think about you, you do. So we all tend to comply to the will of others. Um, so we all tend to conform and we all tend to follow the basic rules. You know, we raise our hand in class. We don't cut in line. We stop at red lights, for example. We tend to go along because we want to be liked. Yes, you have countercultures and you have, you know, things that deviate from that, of course. But in general, most people want to get along with other people. It's also built into our biology, though. 
We have agreeableness. We have this idea to work together. We have altruism where we do give up the excess to other people. That's built into our biology. But again, most of us tend to conform to the rules and we tend to conform to other people. Okay, so the great experiments that the book talks about, you have uh, the Osh experiment, the Milgram experiment, and the Zimbardo experiment. In the Osh experiment, these people are all um experimenters and this guy is a participant okay they ask everybody you know um which line is this matches this other line and all these people say the wrong thing and this guy even though he knows that they're all saying the wrong thing doesn't want to look weird from the group so he goes along and says whatever they say so even when we know the group is wrong, we tend not to like tell them because we don't want to be the outside guy that's like saying, hey, you guys are wrong. We tend to want to conform to the group. These are um, very ethically questionable experiments that you really can't do in modern times. But the Milgram shock experiment, this is when the researcher would tell the participant that when somebody else on the other side got the wrong answer, they had to shock them. The majority of people shocked people. The goal of this was to understand uh, why the Germans didn't stop the Nazis and that's totally inaccurate because there were people before Hitler trying to rise that were fighting against Hitler They just lost but in the end most Germans kind of went along with the Holocaust Okay, and the idea is it's because those in authority were telling them to do it We don't technically question authority and the Stanford prison experiment was an authority experiment where you had a dominant and submissive group And they wanted to see what would happen when you put people in positions of power And as you might expect people that were given prison guard positions Highly subjugated those that were given the inmate positions and this was done on a college campus and you can see all these videos um, The book covers this and then there's YouTube videos for all of these but the idea is they definitely show you how we all conform to the norm, okay? The book talks about group leadership, power, and authority. You just need to understand that power is your ability to um, influence your will upon other people. There's coercive power that's backed by threat, influence that's used as persuasion, traditional authority like the police, I'm so sorry, uh, traditional authority like the head of the tribe, and then legal rational authority like the police, okay? You have leaders that are charismatic, again, using your personality. You have instrumental leaders that are goal-oriented. Then you have expressive leaders that use emotions. Okay, so your organizations, you know, as society has become more formalized, bureaucratized, rationalized over time, you've had this development of cultural institutions that have grown over time. Again, the education system, the media, government, politics, military, uh, the family, religion, economics, these are all institutions, the economy, sorry, these are all institutions that structure our life that are formal and rational. They are bureaucratized systems, okay? Institutions can be material and non-material, so not only all those systems that I just mentioned, but race is an institution. This idea that people actually have a race, white or black, which is completely inaccurate, nobody is actually white or black, um, but the idea is that... Um, you know, ideas are institutionalized too. Our culture is institutionalized. Religion does have physical things like artifacts and objects, but religion, again, is a philosophy that's been institutionalized over time. So it can be physical and non-physical. Okay, again, society is just a group of people interacting. The book covers Gemin Shaft, society with strong bonds, the Giselle Shaft, the society with weak bonds that we have today. Again, our society has grown from hunter-gatherers, to becoming agrarian, to industrial revolution, to the formal technological revolution, to eventually building this formal, rational, bureaucratized system that we have in modern times, okay? So a bureaucracy is just a group trying to be efficient by informing rules and regulations and policies to structure the way it functions, okay? So a bureaucracy is a formal organization that is hierarchically structured. Each division is specialized. There's rules. It tends to be impartial and impersonal. Uh, it's a goal. It's, it's all about goal, outcome, profit margins. It is a dominant form of social organization in society. In modern times, the United States, when we have a, a developed, pretty, you know, modern society, even arguably a postmodern society where we're kind of going beyond the technological revolution. 
And then Weber does coin the term the Iron Cage, the Iron Cage of bureaucracy, that once the system you know, becomes so big, it goes beyond all of us. It just becomes this formal, impersonal system that is absolutely rational. And with that comes problems because can the bureaucracy change and evolve to update? Okay, McDonaldization coined by George Ritzer. Again, this is the idea of all things just becoming an assembly line. So again, our bureaucracy, the U.S. Postal Service, is just an assembly line. Just nonstop, continuous assembly line that is pretty much on autopilot, even though it's not because it takes a bunch of people to run it. Okay? So thank you so much. Again, groups are incredibly important because you learn your culture from the group that you identify with. The groups that you belong to are associated with whether or not you historically received prejudice and discrimination or allowed to rise up the social class ladder. And you can see that our society has become more formal and bureaucratized over time to incorporate a larger group and be able to manage that group size. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.